So it is 10.45 my time, 11.45 Eastern. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think our first speaker is already here. Um, so as soon as we get through this, um, if Marina's ready, she can go ahead. Um, so we're gonna hear from Marina, Trevor and Newt, and then we're gonna have a short five minute break. And then we'll hear from David, Brent and Allie. Um, and then in true waste fashion, we'll have a nice little 20 minute discussion at the end. Um, so I am gonna ask that everyone uh, try to remain on mute when you're not speaking. Um, and you're absolutely welcome to use the chat um, as the talks are going on um, to leave your questions for any of the speakers there. And uh, everyone's gonna have eight minutes to speak um, but you'll see from this schedule here that there's 10 minutes allotted to everyone. That's to allow for transition time and also possibly a very short uh, question um, during that transition. Uh, and anything that we don't have time for during that transition, you can save for the end uh, for the session discussion. Um, and we're going to try our best to stay on track because there are um some people who are unavailable later and we want to make sure that at least all of our speakers are present for the discussion so that we can um ha have everyone everyone there um i think that's all uh cd do you have anything to add um no just uh, yeah hello everybody uh, just to let you know that um i was asked to step in for uh Gerhard Kuhn. Gerhard Kuhn is unfortunately unavailable today because he has to attend uh, the funeral of uh, one of his RV colleagues. Uh, some of you may know uh, Christian Haas, uh, a marine geologist who was uh, based on the uh, island of Silt. Uh, Christian had worked mainly in Greenland, but he has also worked um, uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, mainly uh, King George Island and on the East Antarctic uh, continental margin. And uh, sadly, Christian has passed away. So I'm just to step in for Gerd Kuhn. Thanks. Okay, thank you, CD. Um, uh, Newt, do you have everything uh, ready that you were working on there? I see in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, I think we should be good to go. I just wanted to make a number of people co-hosts in case we have any Zoom bombing incidents so that people can remove people that could happen here, even with the password. And then for each of the presenters, I think we will try to also make you uh, a co-host during your presentation time. And this session is being recorded. Uh, and so if you would like your talk not to be recorded, please make sure you uh, to tell us that and we'll stop recording for your talk, but otherwise uh, we'll just record the whole session. Uh, I think that's it, unless I missed something, some of the other waste organizers are here, so can chime in if they'd like. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so, um... It looks like it's just about time to get started. So um, welcome to session four, past records of changes and processes. And the first person we're going to hear from is Morena Miles. And she will be speaking about asynchronous behavior of local glaciers and grounded Ross Sea ice in the Royal Society Range, Antarctica, during the last glacial maximum uh, and deglaciation. So take it away. Hi, thanks, Lindsay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Just a moment. There we go. Can everyone see that? All good? OK. All right. Hello, everyone. I am here to talk about the interactions between local alpine glaciers and the grounded Ross sea ice during the LGM. During the LGM, grounded ice expanded out into the Ross Sea to the continental shelf margin, shown in the red circle. There are two central ideas as to what caused the expansion of grounded ice in this region. 
The first is that both local alpine and outlet glaciers thickened and expanded to produce the ground to grass sea ice. And the second hypothesis, however, local alpine and outlet glaciers did not thicken and may have instead thinned due to colder temperatures resulting in decreased accumulation during the LGM. In this scenario, the grounding in the Ross Sea was caused by marine mechanisms, such as a lowering of sea level, and interior ice thickness remained the same or perhaps even thinned. Discriminating which of these ideas is correct is important to understand the driving forces of the Antarctic ice sheet and how it will respond to future climate change. In order to test these ideas, I carried out field work in the Royal Society range along the Ross Sea. This is an image looking, this is an image from Google Earth looking to the northeast towards Ross Island. My field area consists of Walcott, Houchin, and Ketlitz glaciers, all of which are local alpine glaciers. However, Walcott and Houchin terminated on land, while Ketlitz terminates in the Ross Sea, in the area that was once filled by grounded ice. During the LGM, grounded ice filled the Ross Sea and extended landwards to the red dashed line, referred to as the Headlands Moraine throughout this presentation. This limit is higher to the north, indicating that it was deposited by grounded Ross Sea ice and not an expanded Ketlitz Glacier. This area is important because of its potential for interactions between local alpine glaciers, which today end on land, and the Ross Sea ice. The goal of my study was to see whether these local glaciers expanded eastwards to the red dash line over here during the LGM, which would support hypothesis one, or if they behaved out of phase, which would support hypothesis two. To carry out this project, I used the following methods. I created a glacial geomorphologic map of surficial deposits, which you will see in the next slide. I also collected samples of subfossil algae for radiocarbon dating. These algae grew in shallow ice marginal ponds and streams along the headlands moraine, the red dash line in the previous slide, as the moraine was being built. Therefore, these algae date the formation of the moraine. I also collected samples from boulders, such as this nice perched boulder in front of Houchin Glacier, for beryllium-10 surface exposure age dating. This is the glacial geomorphologic map I mentioned in the last slide. Walcott and Houchin glaciers are on the left and center, and Ketlitz Glacier, which has expanded into the area once filled by the grounded Ross Sea Ice, is on the right. The grounded Ross Sea Ice expanded westwards multiple times in the past, depositing units drawn in orange, with the darkest orange being the most recent, the LGM deposit. Outboard of this are deposits dating to stage six and older in progressively lighter shades of orange. Alpine deposits are in shades of purple, with the darkest purple being the most recent. This includes deposits along Ketlitz Glacier, which we will get to in a moment. One of the important things this map highlights is that there are cross-cutting relationships in the area south of Walcott Glacier. The Ross Sea Drift is draped over top of older alpine deposits, indicating that they advanced out of phase with each other. Nowhere do I see evidence that alpine glaciers expanded to join the Ross Sea ice, as would be expected if hypothesis one is correct. This is a schematic image looking southwards from above Walcott Glacier into the area with cross-cutting relations uh, that shows these cross-cutting relationships. The red and orange Ross Sea Drift units are draped over top of the purple Walcott Alpine deposit. Once I had an understanding of the deposits, I wanted to develop a chronology for the drift units. I'm going to show two areas where I have more detailed information in terms of radiocarbon ages. On the left will be the area in front of Walcott Glacier, and on the right will be the area in front of Houchin Glacier. I would like to draw your attention to the dates along the outermost limit of the LGM deposit, along through here and here. These ages indicate that the grounded sea ice reached its maximum in the area around 18,000 years ago, 
and maintained its position until at least 14,000 years ago. An interesting point is this date by Ketlitz Glacier down here in the bottom. This age is from algae within lake sediments that were then thrust upwards by an advancing Ketlitz Glacier, indicating that Ketlitz has expanded in the last 6,500 years during the Holocene. I also collected samples for beryllium-10 dating. Most of the results I have so far are in the area around Walcott Glacier. So let's zoom in. Radiocarbon ages are in green on the right, and beryllium-10 ages are in white and blue on the left. The grounded Ross sea ice expanded from the right of the screen towards the left, reaching its maximum during the LGM at around 18,000 years ago. Walcott Glacier, however, has not expanded significantly beyond its current limit in the past about 40,000 years and appears to be currently expanding. There is no evidence that this alpine glacier advanced during the LGM. Some preliminary conclusions from this research are that there are, is that the grounded Ross Sea Ice expanded landward several times, with the most recent expansion reaching its maximum around 18,000 years ago and maintaining this position until at least 13 to 14,000 years ago. Alpine glaciers have expanded in the past. However, the most recent expansion beyond their current extent was between 35 and 45,000 years ago. Alpine glaciers did not expand during the LGM and they appear to be expanding at present and overriding the most recent moraines. This supports hypothesis two in the McMurdo Sound region, that these glaciers behave out of phase. This is likely due to marine mechanisms controlling the extent of the grounded Ross sea ice, while accumulation rates control the extent of alpine glaciers. Ah, there we are. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question. Yep, go ahead. Uh, this is Trevor Hillebrand. Um, I was wondering, I saw in your maps you have some uh, surface streams draining off these glaciers and, and ending in fans, is that correct? Uh, yes, there are deltas between okay. the alpine glaciers yeah. and catalysts. Is there any, um, is there any indication or possibility that those in, uh, complicate your interpretation or at all, or are they far enough away from uh, all your samples? Um, we do have some radiocarbon samples from those deltas, actually, and along those streams. Uh, we just have a few so far, um, but they actually seem to go pretty well with the retreat from the LGM limit back down towards current position. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. We still have time probably for one more short question, if anyone has one. Okay, and can, we can make a transition. Okay, can I just uh, uh, ask a question? Very nice uh, presentation. I was wondering how your results fit to the results on um, looking at provenance in uh, tills from the Ross Sea shelf. So the, the work Kathy Licht has mainly done. I, I think I remember there was some evidence that uh, some of these glaciers advanced across the uh, Ross, con uh, uh, yeah, the continental shelf in the Ross Sea at the LGM. Um, yes, actually there is Kenyite, um, which comes from Ross Island in the Headlands Moraine north of Houchin Glacier, so in the northern part of the field area. The Kenyite stops just right before um, Houchin Glacier, and I have not found any in the deposit south of there, but there is quite a bit in that moraine. All right, thank you, Marina. Um, Trevor, uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, great. So Trevor is going to be talking about uh, the variable response of transantarctic outlet glaciers to grounding line retreat during the last glaciation. Okay, are you seeing my screen here? We are. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Trevor Hillebrand. I'm a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab. And these days I work on uh, modeling modern changes in Greenland, but I want to talk about something that's been bothering me for the past five or six years since I uh, started my PhD, which was the response of transantarctic outlet glaciers uh, to granulin retreat during the last glaciation. So we're looking at the uh, bed topography of the Ross embayment here. Uh, so deep blues are deep bathymetry, gray is above sea level and white is around sea level. Um, and this black curve is the modern grounding line, the orange is the LGM grounding line. And all these dots indicate places where we have some idea of what happened during the last deglaciation, whether it's uh, ice thickness changes or grounding line position or relative rates of grounding line retreat. Uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, so I apologize if I missed your data point here, but um, it's just to illustrate the point that we really don't have an idea of what happened under most of the present day Ross ice shelf in terms of grounding line retreat. So I want to think about what terrestrial records uh, can tell us about grounding line retreat in this data gap and specifically records uh, paired with numerical models. So here are uh, thinning chronologies from a set of transantarctic outlet glaciers that drain into the modern day uh, Ross ice shelf. So this is Perry Spector's work and uh, Courtney King's recent publication from Hatherton Glacier. Um, and these thinning chronologies, we usually interpret them as saying, well, when, when the ice reached about its modern level, that's when the grounding line arrived at this glacier mouth which is a valid interpretation. But what's always puzzled me is whether or not we can and should interpret the structure and the rates in the, the, longer, uh, the longer chronology dating back to the LGM. So for instance, does the smooth and steady thinning at Hatherton Glacier or at Scott Glacier indicate a smooth and steady grounding line retreat? Uh, or, and conversely, does this rapid pulse of thinning at Beardmore Glacier indicate a rapid pulse of ground line retreat? I would suspect yes, but uh, I have never seen any work that proved this. So this is what I'm talking about today. So to look at this, I ran an ensemble uh, using the Penn State ice sheet model over the Ross embayment over the last 25,000 years at 10 kilometers resolution. Uh, this is driven at the boundaries by a 20 kilometer resolution run uh, over the whole continent that uses the optimized parameter set uh, from Dave Pollard's previous work. And so I'm varying these uh, different parameters that get at the sensitivity of the ice sheet to, uh, to ocean temperature, to glacial isostatic adjustment, to uh, iceberg calving at the front. And then we have to prescribe some basal sliding parameter over the modern day seafloor because there's no grounded ice there that you can use to solve an inverse problem for basal traction. Uh, so we just have to give it a value and I'm varying this over an order of magnitude. So the goal here is to analyze the ice thickness changes uh, near the mouths of these outlet glaciers uh, in response to the rate of grounding line retreat in the model. So here is the mod model data comparison. Uh, these curves are the different model runs, uh, time series at each point here near each of these outlet glacier mouths and they're color-coded by the sliding parameter, with orange being the most sliding and blue being the least. And what probably sticks out to you is that it doesn't really match the data all that well. Um, but I would argue that there are some aspects of this that do match the data quite well, um, and the data don't constrain everything, right? So the LGM ice thickness at Reedy Glacier is poorly known, uh, as is the case at Darwin Glacier. Um, we're actually getting a reasonable LGM ice thickness at Beardmore and a reasonable timing of grounding line arrival, though the path to that is uh, grounding line arrival is not consistent with the data. And we get a reasonable LGM ice thickness at Scott Glacier. So even though we have a uh, poor fit to the data in many cases, perhaps there's still something we can glean in terms of insights from the model physics. And so what I'm looking at is the relationship between thinning at the grounding line, or excuse me, thinning at the glacier mouth and grounding line retreat for each of these glaciers. So this is just a snapshot from the model and uh, 
a transect along one of these flow lines showing the points that I'm comparing through time. And so here I've plotted for all model runs, again, separated out by the sliding parameter, uh, ice thickness change at the glacier mouth uh, as a function of the rate of grounding line migration. And so each, so each of these uh, points indicates a 200 year snapshot. And what's surprising here is that we actually have quite a linear relationship between the rate of grounding line retreat and the rate of thinning at the mouth of Reedy Glacier. So here I have the R squared values uh, for each of these model runs uh, between these two parameters. And we get a median R squared value of about 70%, meaning that there is a, a relatively strong linear relationship here. Uh, for Scott Glacier, we have essentially the same relationship and in fact a tighter distribution. Beardmore, we have a few more outlier runs and a few that are uh, statistically insignificant, but we still get this relatively strong linear relationship. And for Darwin Glacier, everything falls apart. Um, about half the runs show no statistical significance between the rate of grounding land migration and the ice thickness change at the glacier mouth. And so we have this very low R squared value. Okay, so what's going on at Darwin Glacier? Well, Darwin is sandwiched between Bird and Mulock, which are two enormous fast flowing outlet glaciers. Uh, so there's convergent flow of these three glaciers here, and then it has to flow around uh, over Discovery Deep, around Minnebloth, and around Cape Crozier. And so each of these uh, potential obstacles is shown in a bar here. This is ice thickness as a function of distance to the grounding line. And for each of these, there's some response in the ice thickness pattern. So this is just to say that Darwin Glacier's behavior is probably complicated by its proximity to Bird and Mulock and its flow path over and around these uh, obstacles. So I'm gonna step through um, the output from the model run I did using these optimized parameter settings. So here on the upper left, we have the bed elevation and flow lines from each of these. On the upper right, we have the surface speed and the same flow lines, and then I've taken thickness transects along those flow lines in the same color, and the bed is shown in brown. And so as we advance in time towards the present, uh, West Antarctic ice flux becomes relatively larger than East Antarctic ice flux and pushes it westwards towards the trans Antarctic mountain front. And Reedy, Scott, and Beardmore have plenty of room to move westwards, but because uh, Darwin is pinned right up against Cape Crozier and Minna Bluff, it does not. So this is probably a complicating factor in its ice flow. Okay, so to wrap up here, we have this near linear relationship in the model between ice thickness change uh, at the mouths of three of these glaciers and grounding line retreat along their flow line, and it's actually a surprisingly strong linear relationship. But the same is not true for Darwin Glacier. And this is likely due to its convergence with Bird and Mulock in the lateral confinement from uh, Minna Bluff and Cape Crozier to the west. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we can interpret records from Reedy, Scott, and Beardmore in terms of relative rates of grounding line retreat, but we should probably not do this for, uh, for Darwin Glacier, which is too bad for me because I spent most of my 20s trying to figure out what happened at Darwin Glacier. And uh, it's an open question how well we need to get this model to reproduce all the observations in order to be really useful. Um, so I'm, I'm interpreting this cautiously, but I think a better fit to the data may change these results somewhat. Um, and just a plug here for an analysis package I'm working on uh, to plot and analyze Penn State model output. Um, so you feel free to grab it from GitHub and uh, contribute and suggest functions. Thanks. Thank you, Trevor. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think we have time for just a very short one uh, as we transition. I have a question. Hi, Trevor. Um, also, that analysis package would be awesome. So I'm glad to hear that that is something that might be available. Um, one thing that um, I've been discussing lately is 
how, what is the impact of having um, ice thinning histories at the margins of glaciers, right? That's where we can collect data is at the sort of the margin of the glacier. Do you think that some of the model data mismatches might be due to the fact that the marginal thinning isn't reflecting the trunk glacier behavior? Right, so these thinning histories are possibly noisy or biased low compared to the actual ice thickness. Yeah, um, I mean, the fact that we're looking at a 10 kilometer resolution model versus these data uh, probably makes that comparison tough. Um, but I've thought a lot about that too. And you can use sort of geometric arguments to project, uh, to project the elevations of the samples back onto like a glacier center line. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. It might not work everywhere. But. All right, great. Let's go ahead and transition. Uh, maybe we'll talk more about that in the discussion. Um, all right, so next we have Newt Christensen, and he'll be talking about um, investigating the history of ice dynamics at the intersection of the West and East Antarctic ice sheets a progress report on geophysical surveys at Hercules Dome. All right, let's hear it. Okay, uh, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. And uh, uh, if so, I'll just get started here. And so this will be uh, just a brief overview of the recent work we've done at Hercules Dome. And I'm speaking here for a team. Uh, and so uh, the names are listed on the slide. And then that's the field team pictured as we are picked up uh, in late January by the Air National Guard. And uh, we hope to continue collecting data for at least one more field season. So these results are uh, incomplete and pretty preliminary, but I think they're worth sharing and are interesting. So uh, we're trying to answer a really basic question, which was sort of what, how big was the West Antarctic ice sheet during recent warm periods, particularly the last interglacial period about 125 to 120,000 years ago. And that might provide the best analog for what the ice sheet might look like uh, in the coming centuries. This is a past record session. The model that Rob DeCanto and David Pollard run has been uh, very powerful for looking at past records of ice sheet change and using that in combination with data. And one of their scenarios, uh, an aggressive one, shows that up to 7.5 meters of sea level rise occurred during the evening. This includes marine ice cliff effects, which are controversial, but worth considering. But even their, uh, their runs without marine ice sheet effects show substantial uh, retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And getting ice from that time period has been problematic. And it's been problematic because if there was no ice sheet, there of course is no ice, but the flow of the ice would also affect that ice away or it would melt off the bottom on large ice shelves. And so the existing cores in West Antarctica, waste divide, go back about 60,000 years, not nearly enough to see in this time period. And the ice that does exist in areas like Marie Birdland, or possibly in the Whitmore Saddle, the Ellsworth Mountains, that all has interrupted chronologies. And so we, we have some data on isotopes from, uh, for example, from a, a horizontal core at Mount Moulton and Marine Birdland, but they're not a good perfect chronology and it's difficult to get an idea of the time series of climate change that might be associated with uh, a West Antarctic ice sheet change in size over several thousand years. And so the question is whether we can find a better place and Hercules Dome looks appealing because it almost certainly would have remained glaciated during this time period, but it would have been close enough to the change in ice sheet size to feel the climate effects that are associated with that change, which I'll mention briefly in a slide or two. So how do we go about answering this question? We would like to infer past ice sheet size and extent from sea level and biological proxies. It would be very helpful to have an ice core record that sampled this time period well and recorded the climate change associated with that. And the East Antarctic cores also don't help because they're just too far away and record global climate, but don't see the regional climate change associated with uh, a West Antarctic collapse or just change in size. And then of course, eventually the goal is to use data informed modeling to estimate past ice sheet evolution 
We're already doing that to look at where to place the core. And I'll just show one example slide of that kind of modeling before hopping into the geophysical analysis. And so this is work that uh, Marina Duch, Eric Steig, and others at the University of Washington, along with those at, at the British Antarctic Survey, have been doing where they take the output from Dave Pollard and Rob DeConto's model and put it into a weather model. And this has actually produced more complicated results than the initial work that Eric and others did several years ago now, where if you remove West Antarctica, you get increased cyclonic flow, which tends to bring warm air up towards the plateau and would result in uh, that warmer air being recorded in the ice at Hercules Dome. And these results show a more complicated picture where there's influences of local topography. This is a weather model, not a climate model, so it's running at very high resolution. Uh, and it, it requires us to look more, but there are strong isotopic signals associated with the change in topography, uh, regardless of whether uh, of the exact details. And so we can use this data to look at where to put the ice core in addition to the ice flow, which is where I'll, I'll concentrate for the rest of this talk. So what are our objectives? For those of you, again, who uh, maybe aren't familiar with Herc Dome, and I hope you can see my mouse here, it's kind of located right here in the bottleneck between East and West Antarctica, uh, uh, a stable ice, kind of a, an ice divide that looks like it's been in roughly the same location, it certainly has moved a bit, but it's kind of locked in place by the mountain ranges. And that, that also means it would be difficult for the ice to retreat uh, through this without substantially more warming than occurred during the Eemian. So we want to determine if the ice in this region is suitable for an ice core. How do we do that? We look at the stability of divide flow. We look at 3D velocity measurements. We'll look at the bed. We'll try to create a radio, radio stratigraphy, creating dated, uh, date the ice, and then just see if there is EME and ice there. And that's what this talk will concentrate on. Just to show it's rough there, it's hard to get a plane to land. This was grooming the runway for the LC-130. It did work. We can land LC-130s there. We can get our gear out there and we can drive radars around. So here's Andrew and Gemma uh, driving one of the radars. We're uh, going to look at radar data from three different places on Hercules Dome. And uh, we just labeled those by grid coordinates. And so there, sorry, there is West Dome here. And then as we go to the grid east towards South Pole, East Dome, and to the grid south, which is uh, confusing the kind of true north, there's South Dome. And so we'll kind of organize around those three lines. In 2018-19, we had a very uh, restricted field season due to logistical delays. And so we only visited these two sites and collected only about 40 kilometers of radar data. This year, we had a much more successful field season and collected about 600 kilometers of deep radar data, along with 350 kilometers of shallow radar data and about 50 PRES sites and GPS uh, and another, I don't know, 50 GPS sites, uh, maybe a bit less. So these white lines are, are, are deep radar lines. The red stars are PRES measurements for vertical velocities in the ice, so using phase sensitive radar. And the black dots are GPS locations. Uh, GPS locations were also taken uh, at every PRES site. And, so the, and then uh, our goal for the final year will be to fill in this area between our survey here and our survey uh, at West Dome. So I'm just going to hop through these, and I think I'm already uh, getting close to the time, so I'm just going to go quickly through. We'll focus in on West Dome first. This is the radar profile. The ice is about 1,800 meters thick. There's a, a ridge at the bed. The surface ridge is not quite co-located, indicating the divide might move around a little bit. It's not perfectly fixed by that ridge, but it's nearby. We can uh, trace layers, and we can use ice flow modeling of varying sophistication to try to uh, date those layers using a very simple 1D approach with a shape factor, a Labutri shape factor for divide versus plank flow. We can figure out where the EME and ice should lie with an assumption about the accumulation rate, which we can back out again from accumulation radar and that's ongoing work. But doing that allows us to date these layers. That's what's shown here. And so down in the deep ice, we're getting into the EME. And, and if we interpolate that, we get uh, an age depth scale. And if we look at the uh, deepest part of that ice, we can see how old it is about, in this case, the Eemian ice will lie above, uh, above the bed by about 20 meters or so for the flank flow, and for the divide flow, it might be more like, like 30 or 40 meters. So what, what kind of shape function should we use? Is it divide flow or flank flow? A PRES can tell us that, and that's what this profile shows. These red lines are the locations of these PRES sites, and so on the top here, uh, it is, uh, indicating that for the middle part of the ridge, there is a high vertical strain at the top of the column, low vertical strain lower in the col column, and that indicates divide flow over the middle. And then over off to the side here, we have less divide flow. 
uh, the, the, the next part of the slide will just be more of a kind of a, almost a show and tell since these radar data are new, but they look exciting. So we'll go to East Dome and I'll show one line there, this BB prime line, there's a deep trough, uh, about a thousand meters. And we can do the same sort of dating exercise, which I'll just kind of pop through quickly. Uh, and here we'll just use a flank flow, no divide flow model. There's no indications of divide flow here. And we can date the layers and interpolate them. The ice is quite thick, about 2.8 kilometers. And so we do hypothetically get Eemian ice, but the flow characteristics are complicated. And the Eemian ice would sit in this band right here. There's also much more complicated flow nearby. And so this line shows what that flow is like. These large glacial troughs exist. They may have subglacial lakes in the bottom of them. The purple line here is Yosemite Valley's profile for comparison. So that's the scale of topography underneath it. And we're not isolated to just one trough. There's at least uh, three of them. And uh, is another example using the different radar system. There is the Seattle skyline in the bottom of one of these troughs. And so East Dome looks like dynamically rich, but probably not a good place to drill a core. But transitioning to South Dome, there's a large plateau. And on that plateau, as we look at the radar across it, that may also be a good place to have an ice core. There's flat stratigraphy, there's indications that it might be frozen, and it uh, is slightly thicker than West Dome, which means we might get a slightly older ice in that location. So just to wrap up, I think I probably exceeded my time. I apologize for that. West Dome looks promising with simple ice flow, clear divide flow. Looks like it is quite likely there from the phase sensitive radar measurements. If the basal melt rate is low, lower than about 90 milliwatts per meter squared, EME and ice is likely preserved in that location and enough EME and ice to get a good record. East Dome does not look like a good place to drill core, but there's lots of deep troughs, subglacial lakes, interesting radar problems, interesting ice dynamic problems. Uh, there may be hints of ice sheet initiation when big glaciers flowed through those deep troughs. Uh, and South Dome it looks reasonable for a core as well from our preliminary analysis. It looks like it has simple flow, slightly thicker ice. We need to revisit the PRS sites, look at the vertical velocities, but it looks promising. And that kind of sets our measurement uh, priorities going back. And I'll stop there. And I suspect there aren't time for questions, but uh, I'm happy to take them if there are or in the discussion. Thank you. All right, thanks, Newt. Um, I think we, we are going to take a short little uh, coffee break um, and I guess try to be back here at 28 past the hour if you can. Um, Newt, I believe you do have a question in the chat, um, so you could uh, go ahead and address that over chat or over audio right now, um, whatever, whatever you would like to do. Um, and everything else we can just um, save for the discussion at the end. All right, so uh, see you all back. Hmm? Yeah, I can quickly address that. Uh, I'm not sure. I would be very concerned about getting a stable record out of the Bird Subglacial Basin or Bentley Subglacial Trench just because the stratigraphy is complicated in that region from the radar data we do have. And there certainly is no evidence of good divide flow. So I think our chronology would be messy there. Uh, I wouldn't be able to give you the exact date of ice there, though. And whether it's we can just drill and have a binary answer, yeah, I'm not sure if we could get a, if we could get a, a a cosmogenic data on that or not. So, okay. All right, see everyone back in five minutes. Um, so we're gonna be hearing from David Small first. Um, and he'll be talking about ice-free valleys in the Neptune range of the Pensacola Mountains, Antarctica glacial geomorphology, geochronology, and potential as paleo-environmental archives. Okay, um, so yeah, a slight change of time scale and a change of accent for us all to listen to. Um, so yeah, some, just some initial geomorphology and geochronology from some ice-free valleys in the Pensacolas. Uh, a little bit of geographical context. Pensacolas are part of the Transantarctics, separating West Antarctica from East Antarctica. In the sort of southeast portion of the Weddell Sea embayment, where the Academy Glacier joins the Foundation Ice Stream right around the grounding line. Um, the main feature of the Neptune Range is this escarpment, the Washington Escarpment, which is backed onto by the Iroquois Plateau, which is a major snowfield at about 1400 metres elevation. So just zooming in a bit, the, the escarpment crest itself trends sort of northeast to southwest. And it's characterized by arets and cirques. 
And as you move away from the escarpment uh, crest, you get these more smooth ridges characterized by rectilinear slopes. Um, now, in many places, ice from the Iroquois Plateau overtops the escarpment, as you can see with these white arrows here. But if you get in the lee of some of the highest peaks, like Nelson Peak or Mount Hawks, you get these reasonable sized uh, dry valleys. And these are blocked at their mouth by lobes of ice that spill back against the regional ice gradient, which is draining into the Roderick Valley and then on into the foundation ice stream. So I'm just going to present some really basic sort of field photographic evidence for ice sheet expansion in this area and some geochronological data that we have that gives us our basic chronology for this. So the first place we're going to go is one of these outlying ridges. This is called Elliot Ridge down in the southern part of the range. And if you're on the ground, Elliot Ridge looks a little bit like this. And if somebody was going to tell me that this is ice molded topography that was produced by an erosive, potentially warm based ice sheet sometime in the past, if they'd given me enough to drink, I would probably believe them. Um, I think the ice flow direction is slightly ambiguous. If I was going to put a bet on it, I would say it's going right to left. These are possibly some lot of remnant plucked surfaces, perhaps. But I think the large scale, morph morph large scale morphology is suggestive that ice overtop this ridge, erosive ice overtop this ridge sometime in the past. Um, also, uh, on the ridge crest, although a lot of the ground is made up of this kind of frost shattered, greasy like material, you do get these erratic type clasts. And as a slight uh, note of historical interest, you might notice some of the names in this note are Dwight Schmidt and Paul Williams of the Hills. Um, and this was a note that Mike Bentley found in an old peanut can on the ridge crest. An interesting thing is that when they traversed these ridges for the USGS back in the 60s, they noted that these erratics were present at elevations up to about 1,000 metres above present day ice. Okay, so that's evidence for ice overtopping some of the high ground in the Ipture range. What about the dry valleys themselves? So we're going to go up to the northern part of the range. In the lee of Nelson Peak, there's an ice free area and it's officially called Miller Valley. Um, this is some world geometry of Miller, Miller Valley that we got. And you can see quite clearly the lobe of ice that spills back to block the valley entrance. From here, the valley floor rises to an upper cirque beneath Nelson Peak. And then in the southern part of the valley, you've got another bowl-like cirque depression with a remnant snow patch, perhaps even a remnant small glacier. So I'm going to show a couple of field photographs that give an idea of the sort of landscape in this valley. The first is from the entrance to the southern bowl. And looking across, you can probably make out that there's a sort of a feature on the, on the valley floor here. Um, on the ground, this feature looks like this. You can see it's positive relief. Um, you can see the figure standing on the crest and a, an escarpment, a scarp slope that's about three to four metres in height off to his left. You can track the front of this feature all the way across the landscape, right onto the hill in the middle distance, where its limit is delimited by that distinct change in colour of the surficial material, which is representing a change in degree of weathering. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the origin. I think the best guess for the formation of this feature is it related to ice expansion out of the southern cirque. Uh, and then as this ice uh, ablated or downwasted, your progressive accumulation of debris on the ice surface until you're left with this relict, uh, sort of a discrete debris accumulation on the valley floor. Um, okay, so next bit of evidence is from the upper part of Miller Valley, just looking across the upper valley floor towards this spur. And when you're up there, the ground surface looks like this. In the foreground, you can see this lithologically diverse, heavily weathered drift deposit. Some polygon troughs are picked out by the, the, the lines of snow on the ground. And then on the hill slope in the middle distance, I think with the eye of faith, maybe even a, not even needing the eye of faith, you can see these trim lines or drift limits that dip into the head of the valley. And I guess the interpretation here is that at some point, at least once in the past, that lobe at the front of the, uh, the valley mouth expanded to the back of the valley to deposit these drift deposits. So I think there's evidence of at least two phases of ice expansion, one ice sheet and one local glacier within these valleys. So what about our chronology? So the chronology is coming from these three same sites I've just showed you. We've got Lower Miller Valley, Upper Miller Valley, and Elliot Ridge. And these are beryllium-10 uh, exposure ages. So just a, a sort of camel plot to show the spread of these ages. The, the Lower Miller ages are all younger than 500,000 years, ranging from about 150 to 250,000. Erratics in the drift sheet in Upper Miller Valley 
They range from just over a million years to just under two million years. And then on Elliott Ridge, both erratics and bedrock have comparable exposure ages that range from about 1.2 to just over three million years. And this distinct partition of population of exposure ages is also reflected in our paired isotope data from the same site, where the lower Miller Valley samples have a distinct burial signal, also suggesting that they were initially deposited and then uh, accumulated nuclei, then buried and re-entrained before depositioning in their current configuration. Whereas in Upper Miller Valley and Elliott Ridge, the nuclei concentrations are consistent with, but importantly, do not mandate a single and continuous period of exposure uh, since the, the erratics were first in place. I think we then tried to kind of come up with a, a basic chronology, a sequence of events. So the, the provisional idea is this, that you've got warm-based ice sheet overriding quite a long time, well, certainly long before three million years ago, producing the bedrock morphology on the, the high ridges and potentially depositing some of the erratic class that are found up there. And then over two million years ago, we have initial ice sheet expansion into the valleys to deposit the sort of heavily weathered drift we see at the valley head. And then within the last 250,000 years, you have expansion of local ice masses to deposit the more freshly uh, weathered material on the, the valley floors. And I think the critical thing here is that this sequence of events is broadly comparable to the, the sequence of events that's proposed in the Dufek Massif in the northernmost part of the, the Pensacola Mountains. And I guess the potential of these valleys is, is it, is it the case that ice-free areas in the Pensacolas have a, a plyo or even a Miocene to Pleistocene a glacial chronology recorded within them? And does that represent a regional signal of ice sheet evolution over the last sort of three to five million years? And then as an aside, in terms of paleoenvironmental archive, there are a number of places where we have deposits that have a distinct appearance of um, positive relief. These sublimation type polygons are characteristic of buried ice in the subsurface. And I guess the question is, much like in many places in the higher parts of the McMurdo Dry Valleys, is there a potential for retaining glacial ice within these Pensacola Mountain Dry Valleys? And again, is that something that would be worth future investigation in any future field seasons? Okay, I shall leave it there. And if anybody has any questions, stick them in the chat or, yeah, by the way. We do want to encourage any um, early career questions. Um, so please, please go ahead and speak up. All right, we'll see if any show uh, show up in the discussion, but we, we do need to move on now um, to hear from Brent. Uh, so the title of this talk is uh, Towards a Complete Picture of Holocene Ice Surface Changes at Thwaites Glacier Using Subglacial Bedrock Exposure Dating. Well, thanks everybody, and especially thanks to the organizers of WACE. It's uh, fun to have it spread out over three weeks so the fun never stops. Um, so I'm here representing the entire geological history constraints team as part of the International Thwaites Glacier collaboration. So here's a, a photo of this motley crew uh, from a few years ago at WACE in, uh, in New York. Um, but moving on from that, um, I just want to talk a little bit about what we did this past uh, field season at Mount Murphy and in the Hudson Mountains. And so if we think about what we know about Mount Murphy, initially we have a really nice record of exposure age data from Joe Johnson uh, from the Mount Murphy Massif uh, and specifically thinking about uh, data that shows a progressive thinning of the ice surfaces uh, or the ice surface from the early Holocene to close to the present ice surface uh, 
commencing about 3,000, or uh, uh, ending about 3,000 years ago. So about 3,000 years ago, we had ice thickness that was similar to the present, but thinning uh, quite rapidly. And so the question is, did ice continue to thin to the present ice surface, or did it continue going down below the modern ice surface? And it subsequently uh, it increased in ice thickness uh, in, the, in the very latest Holocene. So the idea behind that is that uh, to get at this question, we have to look at ice uh, or we have to look at surfaces that are presently covered by ice if we're to use uh, exposure dating. And so to do that, we look at subglacial exposure dating. And this is becoming more of a common idea, but it's a traditional approach that uses beryllium and aluminum 26, which are two uh, relatively long lived nuclides. And so we're going to use uh, carbon-14 that's produced by cosmic rays. And the idea is that we can predict maximum C14 concentrations in ice-covered bedrock if that ice never changed. But we get measurable signals and changes in the concentration of carbon-14 if there was a uh, change in ice thickness. And we can look at various depths uh, below the modern ice uh, surface. And so if we get these measurable deviations from this null hy hypothesis here, um, we can infer that a thinning thickening cycle must have taken place. So the goals were to obtain geological records of past ice sheet change during the past few thousand years. We did this at two of, of the only rock outcrops that uh, abut the Thwaites Pine Island Glacier systems. Uh, that's at Mount Murphy and in the Hudson Mountains where there's a series of exposed volcanic peaks. Uh, and then additionally, there's also a relative sea level uh, history that's being constructed uh, in Pine Island Bay on a number of the small islands in that region. Uh, and that's work being led by Scott Braddock and Paul as part of the project. And I know they're presenting that work at AGU this coming winter. So definitely uh, take a look at that. So if we go to Cape Peak, which is a submassive of Mount Murphy. Uh, we see our camp and our drill site. We're immediately adjacent to the Cross and Ice Shelf and Polk Glacier shear margin. And the idea is we wanted to collect bedrock from this peak that plunges under the ice surface. And to do that, we first have to find where the ridge is subglacially. And so Seth Campbell led both a shallow and slightly deeper um, uh, radar survey of the site. And we can see if we look along the ridge, we can see the ridge descending down towards the Pope Glacier margin. And if we look across the ridge, we can see uh, so some complex reflectors, but by and large, we see a very nice uh, ridge surface. So uh, to do that, we first have to make an access hole. We do this with the ice drilling program, Eclipse Ice Core. So thanks to the US ice drilling program. Uh, and essentially we drill and collect ice. We do uh, collect uh, subsamples of this ice, um, but we continue to do this until we hit something hard and inevitably we break something. Uh, and then at that point, we switch from an ice core to a rock core. Um, that is, uh, once we get into rock, quite efficient and we can actually collect a meter and a half of rock in about 45 minutes. So it's a very, very efficient process once we get there. And the outcome of this is that we were able to collect four subglacial uh, rock cores. Um, so three of them are shown here in the composite images. Uh, each of them are about a meter long. But if we look at profile in terms of the orthometric height, we can see our ridge uh, surface descending uh, into the subglacial realm. The red dots are the surface exposure samples. Uh, and then the red, uh, these red dots down here are the subglacial surface exposure samples. And so we uh, unfortunately were only able to collect over a relatively small 30 to 45 meter depth range uh, due to complications associated with the Bergschrund and heavily crevassed ice. Uh, additionally, the uh, ice in this area was um, uh, wet based and we actually had flowing water at the base of the core. So that complicated drilling efforts. Um, so where do we go next? Uh, so at the same time, uh, we had Joe Johnson and John Woodward were leading a campaign in the Hudson Mountains uh, doing some of the uh, 
some geological reconnaissance both on the surface but also to guide where we're going to drill uh, in the future. So we have Pine Island Glacier flowing right here, its shear margin, and they actually visited nearly every single one of these small volcanic noon attacks. Uh, and in the end, we settled on what has now been renamed Winky Noon Attack uh, in homage to the Winky drill that we're using to collect these subglacial cores. Uh, and Joe found fantastic volcanic geology in this region, uh, beautiful striated Pahoehoe lava, uh, lots of great volcanic clastic debris, um, and Joe could, could give about four talks on the fantastic surface geology that she saw there. Uh, but in the end, uh, we were there to do subglacial reconnaissance. John uh, Woodward uh, collected radar around the, the perimeter of most of these noon attacks. And we ended up settling on Winky Noon Attack for a combination of both glaciological conditions as well as lithological conditions at the site. So it's a very small cr crescentic shaped noon attack. Uh, this is the view from the top of Winky Noon Attack, looking back over towards Weber Noon Attack, uh, Smiling Joe on one of the few sunny days they had there. Uh, and this is looking down the ridge of Winky Noon Attack with the Pine Island Glacier right out here, Shepherd Dome out here. And this is going to be the approximate drill site where we go whenever we get into the field and, and ultimately dig out our gear. So at the same time, Joe also collected, uh, I believe it's 75 uh, surface exposure dating samples from this region. So in addition to uh, eventually getting information on uh, past ice extents when it was thinner than the present, we should also have a fantastic collection of above ice data. And so with that, I think I'm more or less out of time. I may have gone quick, but I think that's okay. We'll get caught up. So thank you. All right, we do have uh, a couple of minutes for questions for Brent. Brent, are you worried about that uh, flowing water at the bed? Do you think you might have problems with erosion of the signal or if it's you know, a Holocene signal you're looking for, are you gonna be okay? Um, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's very like, it's frozen to the bed now where we were able to collect drill cores. Um, we didn't collect any cores where we had flowing water. Uh, that being said, all of the basal ice is more of a, an ice hill mixture. And so there definitely was sliding ice at some point in the past. When, okay. when in the past that was, we don't know. Yeah. So I guess if you get a signal, you still get a signal. So exactly. Yep. yep. And I should say we haven't done a single thing with any of the samples yet um, because they've been locked up in Berkeley and lost in the FedEx system for a month and we finally have them all now. All right, thank you, Brent. Uh, if anyone has any more questions, uh, throw them down in the chat or save them for the discussion. Um, we're gonna transition now to Allie Lepp and I can see she's ready in the UVA lab. Uh, she's gonna be talking about persistent meltwater discharge from Thwaites Glacier recorded in offshore sediments. Okay, hey everyone. I'm very happy to be following Brent because we're sticking with Thwaites Glacier. Uh, my name is Allie. I'm a PhD student at the University of Virginia, um, and I also work with ITGC, but I'm a part of the Thwaites Offshore Research Group, or THOR. So today I'm gonna to be sharing some results from our 2019 cruise, which demonstrates persistent meltwater discharge from Thwaites is being recorded in offshore sediment. Uh, you guys can all position your Zoom tile here in the upper right-hand corner, and we'll get started. Um, so one of the ways that Thor's work provides a valuable paleo uh, perspective to the contemporary weight system is by collecting sediment cores which extend our observational record. So this map here shows a, a wide distribution of some of those sediment cores that I'll be uh, incorporating to interpret the past meltwater discharge signal from weight. Um, 
So today I'm just gonna focus on two cores that were collected during the 1902 cruise. So the first is KCO4. This is recovered from a paleo pinning point that has been termed H2. Uh, remote sensing data in 2011 uh, indicated that the Thwaites ice tongue was pinned on this high. It has since retreated sometime after 2011 and before the 1902 cruise. And the other core is KCO8. KCO8 is uh, collected from this trough. This trough actually extends uh, further east and connects with the Pine Island Bay trough um, or the Pine Island trough. Uh, the core is approximately 20 kilometers from the modern uh, ice tongue margin. And it's important to keep in mind that sedimentation to this area is really restricted to uh, localized gravity flows, to rain out from marine organisms in the water column, uh, to ice rafted debris, and to deposition from sediment laden meltwater plumes. So for the sake of time, I'm actually going to start with uh, some of the conclusions that we have right now. Um, we employ trace model geochemistry to um, best reveal that, that between these two core locations, the sediment source is, um, uh, has, a common, has a common source, and that source is consistent with the surface sediments found in the western Amundsen Sea uh, embayment, the tidal sediments. Down core consistencies in trace metal ratios also indicate that there's been no major sediment source change during the unpinning of uh, the ice tongue from the H2 high. And also that any sediment delivered via um, meltwater discharge um, has still remained constant, so there's been no major uh, water rerouting. Grain size and shape analysis has identified two dominant modes in these cores, uh, primarily at 4 and 11 microns. Um, this is also consistent uh, in the more poor sorted sediments. Um, so we're, we're identifying these meltwater deposits that have an enriched uh, dominant mode in, in these uh, finer, finer grain sediments. Um, and when we compare these meltwater deposits to others from the Antarctic uh, continental margin, we see that the Swate subglacial network seems to be transporting slightly finer sediments than other uh, meltwater systems. And I won't get too much into sedimentation rate today, um, but this is something that will be really useful for us in being able to quantify uh, the kind of uh, meltwater discharge volume that's actually needed to, to transport um, the amount of sediment we're seeing offshore. So I encourage everyone to check in with uh, Rachel Clark, the researcher, and she'll be talking about some uh, lead 210 data from the Thwaites region. So here we have two geochemical plots with uh, trace metal ratios on the x-axis plotted against titanium on the y, which is a common proxy just for terrigenous input. And what we can see from our two cores of interest, the green and the pink dots, is that uh, the trace metal ratios remain pretty consistent with one another, which again is, is supporting a shared and common source of sediment between these two locations. For reference, I've also plotted um, the trital geochemical signatures from the eastern and western Amundsen Sea embayment. Um, and we can see, as we might expect, the two cores that were recovered to the west of Swaith's ice tongue, that these sediment cores plot very nicely um, with the, the trital signature from the western Amundsen Sea and are really distinct from those um, that are common in the eastern Amundsen. It's also interesting to see that there is very little um, variation in these trace metal ratios, which again is suggesting that through this whole unpinning process on that H2 high, there's been no major um, changes to the sediment source that's supplied uh, to this region or to um, the trough that is adjacent. Now, when we look at the uh, grain size distribution, we can really see that KCO4 is really um, characterized by decreasing homogeneity down core. Um, so we can see that the mean grain size is increasing as we move further down core. Um, and this is accompanied by an increase in shear strength, an increase in magnetic susceptibility below about 150 centimeters depth. Um, the water content in the upper 30 centimeters of this core is about 40%. And then it remains between 20 to 30% down core with the exception of an interval here at 210 centimeters. From the grain size distribution here, we can see those two dominant modes that I mentioned. Um, the colors here represent, uh, as you get lighter, we're going further down core. What we can see is that in the upper 30 centimeters where this water content is really high, um, 
this primary finer mode is, is much more dominant and there's a smaller contribution to the secondary mode. And then as we go further down core and notice the grain size is increasing, the difference between these two modes becomes less and less. So, so um, the, the sediment is becoming more poorly sorted as we go further down core, uh, which is pretty consistent with like grounding zone proximal sediment. I should also note we do have uh, radiocarbon agents here that our colleagues are actively working on um, constraining a nice age model for us to integrate to this work. Uh, when we compare now to KCO4 deposits, um, there's much less variation as, as in KCO8. The same modes are, are visible at 4 and 11 microns, um, but the contribution uh, to the finer mode is much uh, more consistent, like a much higher volume uh, through the entire core. Uh, this is also reflected in pretty um, consistent down core trends in these physical properties, as well as in mean grain size. So while KCO4 grain size is increasing down core, in KCO8 it's remaining uh, fairly similar. There's little variation in shear strength and the magnetic susceptibility variations are on a, a much smaller magnitude than KCO4. We can also see that the water content down core remains at about 40%, which is what we saw in the, the upper 30 centimeters of um, KCO4. So to further kind of integrate or, or um, assess the connection between these two cores, we uh, use principal component analysis. And this reveals that, uh, you know, we can see from the biplot that the first two principal components account for almost 60% of the total variability. And when we look at the loading scores, uh, we can see um, that the, the factors that are really pushing the KC04 data to the right-hand side of this plot are, are dominated by coarser grain size elements. So higher magnetic susceptibility, higher contribution from sand percent. We see zirconium over here, which is a uh, trace metal often enriched in the sand fraction. Comparing that to what's pushing the KCO8 samples over here to the left-hand side, this is more controlled by higher clay percentage higher iron concentration, where terrigenous iron is, is a similar proxy to uh, titanium, we talked about earlier, and higher water content. Um, so these are uh, kind of more um, traditionally associated with, with meltwater deposits. And we also see this really interesting overlapping area, right? So we want to check out what are these samples in both of these cores that fall in this overlap. And when we plot those samples, we see right away, right, the pink and green lines again. One, we see that the grain size distributions are almost identical um, and, and are dominated by that mode at about four to five microns. And we can see that the distributions where in the core these samples are located are fairly varied from the top all the way down to some 200 centimeters um, in both of these cores. Uh, these are plotted against other meltwater deposits that have been identified from the Ross Sea and the Amundsen Sea. And when we look at these uh, meltwater um, deposits against uh, more poorly sorted um, grain sizes, again, we see the same modes are emerging, um, but a much higher volume contribution. So much better sorting in these meltwater deposits. Um, but it does support the idea, right, that, that these offshore better sorted fine sediments are coming from the same, you know, the same area as these more grounding zone proximal deposits are. And in terms of comparing other uh, physical properties from the slate melt water system to, um, to these others, they are, they are all fairly comparable. So just to uh, go over again what we talked about, the trace metal geochemistry and grain size have shown us that between these two core locations off of the uh, western waste ice tongue, there seems to be a similar source, uh, a discernible meltwater influence that has been persistent before, during, and after the unpinning um, from the H2 high after 2011. We've seen that the subglacial network first weight seems to be transporting slightly finer sediment than other systems that have been identified. And uh, for more information on the age models, everyone should check out Rachel Clark's talk next Friday. So I'll take any questions now or in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ali. That was great. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our session discussion because I know there's some people who uh, probably need to go and might have some some questions. So if you have questions for Ali, uh, you can go ahead and and raise them during this session. All right. Um, so somebody take it away. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I do see one question in the chat about why sweet sediments might be finer. And that's something that um, it's a great question and we're kind of bouncing around a bunch of different ideas, right? Because it could be that it's related somehow to subglacial meltwater drainage styles or systems, but it could also be related to the actual underlying geology and variations in the geology below the sweet catchment compared to, uh, to, you know, in the Ross Sea or under Pine Island, for example. So some of the, the plans that we have for, for addressing that include a strain shape analysis. Um, the SEM lab here at our institution, though, is currently closed and unaccessible. So these are, these are things that we definitely plan to address, but um, in, in the uncertain future. Um, I have another question for, for Allie. Um, I'm, I may have missed it early towards, towards the beginning of your talk, but um, what, what sort of sedimentary structures do you see in these potential meltwater deposits? Um, do you see any laminations? And I did see that you marked IRD um, on one of your grain size distributions. What about like larger IRD because I know that you're you're running matrix material when you do that grain size analysis. So are you finding a lot of pebbles? Um, and also, sorry, this is a lot of questions at once. Are you also doing any diatom analysis? I'm curious about the presence of an ice shelf or sea ice um, in association with this meltwater. Yeah, those are all really important questions. Um, in terms of sedimentary structures, you know, the the meltwater type deposits that we're seeing kind of vary between being finely, faintly laminated and being kind of massive. Um, one thing that's really interesting is that we don't really see any erosive surfaces. So there's not an indication that these meltwater discharge events are like, you know, very high magnitude and super powerful. They seem to be just kind of more slow and steady, like a leaky type system. Um, in terms of diatom assemblage work, um, I know. Becky Manzoni and her students at University of Alabama are doing uh, that element. Um, and we also, at our lab, you know, hope to incorporate uh, beryllium analysis on these sediments in the future to kind of understand the presence of uh, paleo ice shelf uh, during the deposition. And what else did you ask? Pebble content. Pebble content, right, right, right. Um, so the IRD that was noted on that uh, plot was actually from um, Alex Wittes' sample, one of her samples. Um, but currently, I'm actually drawing the over uh, 125 micron fraction from these samples. So we'll just do like a, a weight contribution percent um, to get a better idea of, of, of the concentration. And, and um, you know, from the uh, Geologic Marine Repository, we'll plan to do X-ray scans also in the future. But um, COVID dependent too. Um, Lindsay, there was in the in the chat there was a question from from Lauren regarding the the sources of uh, the uh, debris, uh, which is shared by by uh, Fuades Glacier. So, um, of course, we have collected more samples uh, earlier this year. But what we know so far is that uh, Fuades Glacier is a is a strong source for the. Uh, clay mineral kaolinite, and we know that that is derived from uh, probably pre oligocene uh, sedimentary uh, rocks, so is reworked, and that might also explain uh, the fine grain size uh, 
uh, in these, these uh, meltwater plumoids, which which Ellie showed compared to to uh, other glacier systems. What we also found, and you may remember from Ellie's talk, the uh, high magnetic susceptibility. So we think that there may may also be some uh, gabbros sitting uh, under Fuates glacier. So far in the Amundsen Sea embayment, there is only uh, one uh, gabbro outcrop known, which is Doral uh, Rock near near Mount Murphy. So Brent will know it. Uh, but uh, from uh, aerogeophysical data, there are also some indications uh, that there are mafic rocks uh, under Foyt's glacier. So this is what we know at the moment. And uh, of course, with the uh, samples which we collected last year and, 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 and this year, we hope to, to nail it down a little bit more. I had a question for Trevor, if that's OK. So, so Trevor, there was some the the relative magnitudes of, of thinning and thickening was pretty good in your in your um, your model data comparison, but the relative timings were off at a few sites, and I think uh, Beardmore stuck out in that regard. How you know what what's your assessment? And I know Kier Nichols, who I think is on here, is also thinking about this. Is this possibly you know the models actually being more in line with reality and the and the the geological data may be having artifacts like nuclide inheritance? Um, I'm quite convinced by the Beardmore uh, chronology. I So I've tried a lot of things to vary the time at which the ice sheet in the Ross Sea sort of collapses, and I can't get it to change very much um, in the model. So. I suspect there is something that we're missing in either the forcing or some model physics like uh, coupling, like gravitational effects of, of sea level, regional sea level rise. Um, so yeah, that's, that is the million dollar uh, question. But my, my short answer is I think those exposure ages are quite good. Um, obviously there are some with inherited nuclides as there are everywhere. In Antarctica, but um, yeah, I think the the forcings in the model and some of the model physics could be improved. I have a logistical question for Brent. Um, losing subglacial bedrock samples in the mail is the most horrifying thing I can imagine. Um, what would you What would you suggest we do in the future to make sure that doesn't happen? <laughs> so, uh, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, they were actually the surface samples. Okay. Uh, but the running joke is, once we have our postdocs and students on board, we may you know, handcuff the cores to them like, you know, a, a courier would and put them on a plane. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely going to be watched closely. Got some great discussions going on in the chat. Um, if anybody wants to bring that 
uh, up for everyone to hear. That would be great. Uh, I can answer Keir his question about 14C. Uh, he, yeah, I mean, it'd be great to do it if somebody's got the money because this, this work's not funded at the moment. So, yeah, it's somebody's willing to put the lab work in, I'd be happy to provide some samples from Elliot Ridge and stuff. Um, I have a question uh, for uh, yeah most of the speakers in this session. So uh, Brent, Trevor, Mariana, and uh, uh, David. So we heard uh, a lot about the reconstruction of ice sheet finning on land, and especially Trevor tried to link it also to to grounding line um, retreat. Uh, for a science strategy, is it more uh, required that the people working um, yeah, uh, in the sea on, on from board of a ship, uh, that we um, yeah, coordinate our efforts better with you guys uh, on land? Well, of course, in the ITGC program, we are all focusing uh, mainly on, on, on Freights Glacier. That's one point. But sometimes I'm, I'm, I think we're where there's a little bit of demand really for for better uh, coordinating this because um, of course you guys yeah you have to look where the nunataks are and uh, have to take your samples from there whereas this was uh, also talked about yesterday um, when we are uh, recovering our cores we often um, um, yeah target these these uh, big uh, cross ice shell, uh, uh, paleo ice stream troughs uh, crossing the shelf, and um, yeah, is there a feeling we should better align our efforts to get a better idea about glacial systems and their history? So at least in the Ross embayment, um, my impression is that the onus is totally on the terrestrial folks. Um, because the the marine record there is so rich um but we we have this problem where we're not we're, we're able to get good age constraints uh on land but they're quite sparse in um in space so um and it's it's never been very clear to me how um how easy the age constraints on the uh, marine side are to interpret or to tie to changes um, to changes upstream so i think um, yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily say that the marine people should be going from place to place based on what i need um, but i think i would say that a conversation linking the data that exists in the ocean to the data that exists on land is something that we should be having. And that is a conversation that's obviously ongoing, but um, I need to understand it a lot better. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Trevor. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're operating with linked processes and linked histories, but, you know, it's all going through the filter of glaciology. And, you know, I think to, to really start to make these links is when we have to start bringing in, um, you know, both um, small and large scale modeling efforts that can incorporate, you know, the, the varied uh, geologic and, and geochronologic data sets that exist and, and then interpreted them, uh, you know, whole, you know, as a, as a whole rather than separately. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's been varied efforts, you know, in, in, in recent years. Um, but I think, yeah, we, we need to, particularly in, in the ITGC, we may have the ability to set a model for how to make that work going forward. Um, and so it's been a, it's actually been a bummer that we haven't been able to, to meet as teams to discuss 
uh, you know, our various data that we have. And we have no data at this point. We just have the sample, but uh, we'll get there. Maybe a follow-up question uh, related to that would be whether anybody here thinks that there's a like one specific area where you can really tie the uh, the records from the marine side to the uh, to the terrestrial side, and whether we should just focus on tuning a model to fit this really well uh, constrained region and then expanding that effort out to the rest of the Ross Sea or the Amundsen Sea. I hope someone says yes. I, I may, maybe just a thought, given some logistical issues or, or you know, the difficulty of access, particularly, you know, you've got big ice shelves in the way. Are we better, or you know, as a, just as a general paleo ice sheet community, is there scope for looking at processes and sort of other paleo ice sheets that are marine based and linking things like in Scandinavia or the British Irish ice sheet? Is that maybe slightly easier and data rich to do this sort of thing? Possibly. My impression is that the the amount of surface warming that they like Scandinavia, Beniscanian ice sheet, uh, and for instance, Cordillera ice sheet experience was just so much larger than what we see over the over a glacial cycle in Antarctica that it might not be a one to one comparison. But someone can and should correct me on that. I'm sure. Yeah, it's a fair comment. Yeah, another question which we always encounter, for example, if we, um, um, yeah, so if we write proposals to work on uh, in some areas which are uh, more easily accessible yeah, than, than, than uh, the heart of the West Antarctic ice sheet, yeah, so uh, focusing on a sub Antarctic island or so, when, when often when the question is, 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 is asked about the upscaling, if you can really then transfer your results yeah, uh, uh, from, from such a setting to a, to a big ice sheet where you have to deal with uh, uh, yeah, uh, different uh, uh, processes, different mechanisms. Yeah, if you think, for example, about uh, uh, huge ice shelves, which can buttress uh, uh, quite a lot of, 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 the, the, um, of the ice further, further upstream. And this, this scaling question is, is when, when, when often asked and, and, and quite difficult actually to answer. Uh, hi, Trevor. This is just a response. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. This is just a response to your comment about maybe trying to select a, an area where you could connect the land-based and the marine-based records. I think if, if we've learned anything from the marine record, <clears throat> it's that the, uh, there's a lot of ver spatial and temporal variability along the margin and I think that makes sense, and, and especially on the marine record, because, well, like both records, because of the physiographic differences. So the depth of water the ice is flowing into, the number of pinning points. And as you get on shore, you've got meteorological variability, you've got drainage basin size and area and dipsometry. And so when you put all these things in an equation <laughs> and you try to say, well, you know, what does it tell us? It tells us, well, we should expect a lot of variability. And so I'm, I'm a little concerned at, at the idea of trying to 
uh, find sort of case areas, areas for case studies where you would try to do this sort of thing. I, I think it would be very challenging. Uh, maybe some other people have some comments on that, but to me it's, it's a really challenging thing to do to try to find an ideal area that's going to represent anything more than maybe a 20 or 30 kilometer swath uh, you know, depending on the size of the ice streams or the outlet glaciers. And uh, that's going to be the challenge. Well, with that food for thought, um, our time is up. Uh, there are a few more sessions today and obviously for the next couple of weeks as well. So um, thank you all for tuning in for this session and uh, we'll, we'll get the recording to you as soon as it's ready. All right, thanks everyone, great talks. <laughs>